So, um, I have had the pleasure of uh, meeting Ingrid and, uh, uh, and William before, again, thanks to the Bezos, uh, in a special, special uh, experience that I had at Aspen Institute. And this is my first time meeting Abdurman. Um, so I'm going to just introduce them to you, and then they're going to talk a little bit, and then um, I hope you have lots of questions for them. So, uh, and again, what's my time here? Half hour? Where's the boss? Katie, a half hour? Yeah, okay. So Ingrid and Emma, and Ingrid, by the way, is also uh, in one of my plays. She hasn't seen herself performed yet. But she's a, a star, uh, somebody who I've put myself in Ingrid's shoes. Ingrid Anema is a recent Stanford University graduate from Kigali, Rwanda. Ingrid is a survivor of the 1994 Rwandan Tutsi genocide. She has worked to raise awareness about injustices happening around the world and has helped to curtail the HIV AIDS epidemic for the past four years. Her participation in Global Nomads Group's video conference program between her high school and schools in the US opened her eyes to the rest of the world and changed her life, enabling her to seek an education and do good in the world. Ingrid is currently doing research on brain development at Stanford University and is planning on pursuing a career in child psychiatry. Ingrid likes people. The only thing she likes more than people is food, and I don't know, am I allowed to say the last thing, Ingrid? Sure. Beyonce. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have lots of comrades in the room. Ingrid. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> uh, William Kamkwamba. William, William is a co-author with Brian Mueller of The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, creating, let me say first of all, as I introduce William, that the, the one most inspiring figure to me when I was growing up was Thomas Edison. And William is really a modern day Thomas Edison in many ways. He's an inventor. Uh, the co-author with Brian Mueller of The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, Creating Currents of Electricity and Hope, a remarkable success story about the power of human ingenuity in the face of crippling odds. The New York Times bestseller recounts the story of how he brought electricity and light to his village and family and calls attention to the plight of Malawi, a country caught in the grips of AIDS and poverty. A 2007 TED Global Fellow, Kamkwamba was a student in the inaugural class of the Pan-African Leadership Academy in South Africa. An accomplished speaker, he has addressed audiences at the 2008 World Economic Forum multiple times at TED and at schools and universities around the globe. William is currently a student at Dartmouth University. William. <laughs> Abdurman Jabate. Abdurman was born in Mali, where he spent most of his life. In 2004, he was selected among 6,000 young candidates to be the ambassador of Mali in the prestigious Senegalese Military Academy, where he spent the next year, six years of his life. In 2010, Abdurman gave up his dreams of being an army officer to pursue that of being a future African leader by joining the African Leadership Academy in South Africa. ALA. He spent two years in ALA, during which he took part in various conferences about change and development, such as the Aspen Institute Festival, as a Bezos Scholar. He was the recipient of the Academy's prestigious Leadership Award for two consecutive years. He is the founder of the Malayan Youth Movement for Development, as well as that of a tutoring camp that opens every summer in his community. Abdurman has also worked with three other Bezos scholars to organize the first ever ALA Local Ideas Festival themed Empowering the Youth. The festival challenged youth from all over Johannesburg to design solutions to their community problems and gave them the basic tools to become agents of positive change in these communities. In 2012, Abdurman won a full scholarship to join Deep Springs College. I never heard of it, but it sounds pretty cool. They get to hike all the time one of the most competitive and non-typical schools in America while doing ranch work. 
and having hands-on experience in some of the college's administrative business, such as hiring faculty, and it, yeah, I know, <laughs> and admitting new students, Abdeman continues to believe that he will play a significant role in the future of his continent and of his country, Mali. Please welcome your generation. <laughs> So let's start with you, young lady. Okay. What I've asked each person to do is, is to speak for about three minutes or so, and then to give you their challenge. What, what are they going to give a challenge as well? They're going to tell a, a brief story or explain something that they're doing, and then a challenge. So let's start with Miss Inema. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, so as uh, Anna said, in 1994, I lived through the genocide in Rwanda, and I was um, seven then, and in that genocide, it was a devastating time for my country and for my family. And in, I lost my parents and most of my family. And that is something that you don't, never walk away from. It's, um, it's with you every time and every day. And I've since done a lot of things. Uh, I've graduated from high school, and graduated from Stanford, went through every, you know, SAT studying, all the stuff uh, that you guys are going through. And um, right now, I'm thinking about going into medicine and studying child psychiatry. And throughout my journey, I, it's been overshadowed by my, the challenges I had when I was young. Um, and today, my challenge to you is to not let your challenges cripple you. Let them be a background to the compassion that you carry, your to, you carry to the world and let it influence what you decide to do. My decision to study medicine definitely has been influenced by my experiences growing up. And I just wanna challenge you to do that. Um, that your challenges, the bad things that have happened in your life or that will, because this world we know has ups and downs, let it influence you for the good. Don't ignore it. Um, let, it let it inspire you. So, yeah. Thank you. Abdurman? Jackie wanted me to share this story. I came to America for the first time in 2010 for the Spend Ideas Festival, and when I returned back home, I only had two weeks to spend with my family before I returned back to LA for another program. And the summertime is also the raining season, and when it rains, you have a lot of rainwater staying in puff holes, and you have mos mosquitoes reproducing there, and it's malaria that follows afterwards. And in addition to that, it's like people like myself who like to drive fast at night, and you don't have street lights. Most of the time, you have a lot of accidents happening. And when I left Aspen, I was really inspired, you know, there was this fire for change burning in me. And I'm just like, well, this is something that I should do something about. And then I talked to my brother, I talked to, he talked to his friends, I talked to my friends, and we met at my house. We were like, oh, here's the problem, and this is what we need to do about it. And then the next day, we went to the city hall, we told them that we needed some tools to solve this problem in our community, and they gave us some tracks and then some other tools that we will use. And the day after, I only had two weeks to spend back home. And the day after, we went outside the town. We collected a lot of stones and dirt. And we came in, we put stones in the path holes, and we filled it with dirt. And yeah, that was it. When it rained again, there was no water sitting in the path holes. And yeah, people were really happy with what we've done. And when other young people in other communities heard that we took care of that existing problem in our community, they did the same thing. And 
it went on and on, and it became like a sort of national thing for people to take immediate action to solve the immediate problems that arise in the communities. And when I returned back to South Africa after um, those two weeks, there is this guy called Mohammed, and he's really interested in the type of thing I was doing. And he shoot me an email. He's like, oh, I was really inspired by what you're doing. Any something that is taking a larger scale or a bigger scale in the country. And with him, I decided to start the Malian Youth Movement for Development. And every summer, this is the kind of work that we do in different communities. And then it's like from there, we have decided to expand and start a tutoring camp in the community. And every summer, it's like you have people, community members gathering and then teaching their little brothers and other people's little brothers. And well, tonight or this afternoon, my challenge for you will be, you know, to take immediate action on a problem that exists in your community, no matter how small it is, it doesn't matter. What I have realized here is that you guys have the same opportunity that I had in 2011 when I was in Aspen. It's like you have a lot of people coming, talking to you and motivating you. And it's like they, they light this fire in you that makes you say, that, oh yeah, I wanna change the world. And I say, you know, this is the right time for you to start acting on it because if you wait, and you're like, oh, I can start it today, I'm gonna start tomorrow, and you keep on pro procrastinating. It's like that fire dies slowly, and it's like you won't have the same effectiveness that you will have if you start now, and yeah, don't wait. And one advice in doing that is to make it sustainable, and don't make things rely on you. Don't make yourself the only, the boss, if you know that nothing will work and make sure you, know, you have your friends there, people who can share the leadership burden with you. And yeah, that's my challenge to you. Love that. <laughs> William, William. Um, uh, thank you. So uh, for me, um, the challenge that I had when, uh, when I was growing up was that I wanted to continue with my, my studies, but there were so many challenges that simply would have stopped me from pursuing with my education. One of the challenges was the uh, school fees, to pay for my school fees. It was a little hard. Uh, but looking at the problem that we are facing that back, back then, I thought that if I can be able to study, then I'll be able to, um, to better off my, uh, my life or to help other people in my community. So one thing that inspired me uh, to continue up with my, my studies that uh, yesterday I said this quote that my, my grandmother kind of like inspired me to take an action when things, when you see that there's a problem going on in your life, you don't need to wait for somebody to come in and help you. So that, that quote from my grandmother kind of like inspired me when I was doing out, uh, going to school, I uh, had like some problems, then I had to take myself take some action so that I can be able to solve those problems. So throughout my studies, um, I faced some challenges, some academic challenges, but those challenges, they are not there like to stop me from achieving my dreams. I just like continued uh, working hard, um, making sure that I'm getting uh, what I need to get in order to uh, pursue what I want, um, I want to do in my life. So uh, today I can say like, one challenge that I can, um, I can give to you is that sometimes don't, um, don't wait, uh, take action when you see there's something that is needed to be done. I think even though it can be like a small, but at least if you started, then other people might come along and help you. Every journey started with one step, so if you just take that, that um, you're going to be able to do something to better off your community or your life, I think that would be really helpful. So don't, um, uh, don't wait until you achieve what you're gonna achieve. Um, just remember that in whatever you are, you are going to choose to do, 
there will be like some challenges, but don't allow those challenges to stop you from achieving your goals. Everything is possible, and you can work, you can do it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I have one question for the group. Uh, uh, actually, two quick questions, and then we're just going to open up and. You, you all, I know, will have questions for these three because you'll likely be sitting up here in next year or a couple years yourselves. Um, and the first question I noticed, William, I didn't get to hear you say it, but I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you would if, if we talk long enough. But when I first uh, talked to Ingrid, oh, that was like four years ago or something, Ingrid, that we, five, five years ago, uh, she said something that I really remembered. And then Abdurman repeated the same thing. What, what, um, what, uh, uh, what uh, Ingrid said to me about being at Stanford was that she, she was learning how to think. And then Abdurman said it today. What do you all mean when you say being educated in the West, in America, teaches you how to think? You seem like you're pretty smart. What do you mean by how to think? Well, <laughs> I chose to go to a, really, a, a very non-typical and non-traditional school where there are only 26 students and you engage in very challenging discourse every day of your life. And the reason why I chose to do that is because like back home, young people are not encouraged to think critically you always been told to follow the decisions your elders make for you or the decisions your mom, your dad, your brother and sister make for you. And uh, coming to America was the opportunity for me to criticize the environment around me and try to make a change about it. And, it's like, and I believe that I'm here to learn how to communicate and when I'm saying communicate, it involves all ways of human communication. And for me, it starts internally. And when you're able to think and formulate your ideas better and make your ideas inter... Interoperability. Interoperable. It's like, and you bring that up very well and you communicate it to people in an effective way. It's like your idea will find its way through and it will have an impact on people. And like, that's what I believe I'm, I'm here for. And I believe that it's, like, it's a great leadership skill to be able to make your ideas go through. And for you to do that, it's, like, it has to be people, I, I don't wanna say reasonable, but then people need to they have yeah, to I, I agree with it. Do you mean uh, they have to understand it? Yeah, they have to understand it. So one quick question for you, Ingrid, and then I want somebody to ask William a question because I'm not going to be able to because I want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask questions. So, so Ingrid, you know, in your sense of, of teaching you how to think, I know it comes back to critical thinking and in terms of interop interoperability, when you think about something like compassion, that's very different to, to make building a road could become interoperable. Interoper interoperable, but how would we get at creating more compassion, which you come to? How, how, how would that multiply? Um, that's a really good question. First, I think it's the practice of compassion. Um, the practice of it really, I th I've learned a lot from Watching people um, be compassionate, I think it teaches communicating it. Um, and well, what, what about Beyonce? We were <laughs> laughing about that. But how do you see art and artists and figures like yeah. Beyonce? How do you see her as someone who is a part of multiplying that? You know, I. I think the, the thing that comes to my mind when I see her perform is, you know, strength. And, and she is such a, 
an embodiment of strength and, you know, like a strong woman. And that she does, you know, with her performances, with her art, she really works hard. And it's, it just comes through. And um, she obviously, she has an amazing platform. We all love her. So, and that really, um, influences how we feel. So you, so you talk about having a platform then and having using a platform, it for that benefit. Using it for that benefit. And you can have, I think, compassion is, can be applied in every place, in, in whatever you want to do. I feel like another idea that could be interoperable is when, like, growing up, you have a lot of questions of, you know, what do I want to do with my life? I have no idea. Do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be blah? I don't know. But I think um, another idea that really is applicable in every place is whatever you want to do, you know, how is it compassionate? You know, the, what we heard about, what we heard from Lilu yesterday, love, faith, and hope. How is this idea loving? You know, how is, how is my building of this road or my creation of this thing, how is this loving and, you know, and, and kind and compassionate. And I think that is something that we can all incorporate in our lives. Um, so I think sharing it with, that, with our friends and in whatever, wherever you end up, I think it's, um, it's, it's good if you can incorporate that in your life's work. Let's have the lights up. Uh, lights up, and I would like to invite a question for, for William, our inventor, if anybody has one. Yes, can we get a mic over to here? Thank you, Britta. Hi, my name is Aaron Afalabov, and I'm representing Narbon High School. Um, will this, can, can this question just relate to all three of them? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I know all three of you have, have endured many hardships, especially at home. So I wanted you to know what motivated you, how did you find your compassion to improve yourself, um, leave your homes and come to America? And because I know many of your peers, your family, and your friends endured the same thing. So how were you guys able to find that compassion? How were you guys motivated? Um, for me, I was motivated that if I can be, I can favor up my education, then I can be able to go back and help out to solve those problems that I was facing and those problems that people are facing in my community and in other surrounding areas. So I think that's that like courage that to, to know that there's a challenge there, but I need to do something about it, then how can I do it? That's what uh, motivated me to think of like going, um, pursuing my education so that I know that if I can pursue with my education, then I'll be in a better way of trying to deal out solving those problems because... Um, but you had, for example, you had already solved the problem of bringing electricity to your community that didn't have it, right? Yeah. So, so you probably came to school with a very specific idea of some of the things you needed, some of the tools you needed, or some of the resources you needed, right? Yeah. It's, um, the, challenge is, the challenge is not only like um, electricity challenge, but there's also like so many other challenges. So like through studying, like in my education, I'm taking classes in different departments where I can be able to use uh, those education to solve some of the problems that uh, people are facing. Uh, there will be like education problem, that's some of the problems that people are, are facing. So I'm looking up the ways of how I can be better aware, well, like use the, the knowledge that I'm getting to, to address the problem that people are facing. Yeah. Couple more questions for the group at large. Yes. Questions, folks. You know, I always, uh, I teach at NYU, and at the first day of class, I say two things. One, NYU is New York University. Uh, I'm not assuming it, you know, out west. It's, one, I say, come to college 
to find your questions, not your answers. Or as I've heard quoted, uh, leadership is about finding questions. You can go to Google to find the answers, right? <laughs> and then the other thing I like to say is confidence is overrated. Give doubt a try. And so questions also live in, in where doubt is. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is for William. And I just wanted to know, because you said that you left home to go and find the answers to problems, other problems that you had of where you were from. Were you ever able to return home and fix some of those problems? Yeah, um, pretty much every summer I go back home to work on different projects that um, I'm working on. Uh, one of the projects that I'm working on is like a biogas project. We are trying to solve the problem of like um, deforestation and also um, cooking energy. Many women in my area, they... Cooking. cooking energy? Yeah, yeah, cooking energy. They spend a lot of time looking for firewood, so we're trying to use biogas for cooking. So those are some of the challenges that I'm, um, I'm working on to solve, yeah. I think we have time, yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for just two more questions. Yes. Karen, oh, since you guys have gone through a lot, I'm curious about what kind of things do you, like, do you guys like to do to relieve stress? That's a great question. Besides listening to Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Besides <laughs> listening to Beyonce, okay. And dancing to Beyonce. Um, <laughs> um, I'll go for that. Okay. <laughs> well, I live in the middle of the desert, and we have a lot of horses and a lot of mountains, mountains, and most of the time, I just take a lonely walk, or I go on top of a mountain, I look at the campus, I'm like, wow, how beautiful this is. Or sometimes I go on rides with my horseback riding with my friends, and the other thing that I like to do to relax is throw a disc, a frisbee. And it's something that I've fallen in love with two years ago, and yeah. <laughs> stress, William, what do you do to relieve stress? Uh, to relieve stress, I love just like uh, hang out, chatting with friends. Um, sometimes uh, playing soccer, which I haven't done in a long time. So playing what? Soccer. Soccer, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Mostly like chatting with friends, yeah. yeah. Ingrid? Um, a lot of things, obviously, Beyonce, sing, you know, listening and dancing. Dancing. And <laughs> um, Reading, I read, I, I like to read, um, it, it's good. I, uh, you know, meditation and, and prayer, you know, all kinds of things really. Um, yeah, hanging and out with people. Something you said, I, I just want to point out, uh, Ingrid, when you were talking, uh, when we were in the green room about compassion, you know, it's not all on a global level. You talked yeah. about even finding it in your family. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, really, I think that's the most important. I think day-to-day -day compassion and, and see, see, just seeing what happened in Rwanda and how it was your neighbor who killed you and they believed that, you know, and it's, it's such a personal thing. And if that personal change doesn't happen, I don't think the global change is, will be very success, successful or will go anywhere. I feel like in your family, you know, being kind to each other and in our schools, you know, like this whole bullying problem we have is, is that, you know, the personal isn't fine yet. Thank you so much. Thank and you. so I'm going to leave you with something else we discovered in the green room, which is, uh, you know, the challenges that you've been gathering here can start tomorrow. History is happening. When? When is history happening? Now. Now. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Give these Thank folks a great big hand.